and then a vintage cat exchanger on the right. You see the sample flow in and goes through the resin and on the left traditional column, then it flows to the conductivity cell to measure the cation conductivity. The design on the right, the sample comes in, flows down, and then it flows up through this little funnel and out past the cation conductivity sensor, but it most importantly has the air vent to allow air that is accumulated in the cation exchanger and is entrained in the sample, particularly during startup, to be expelled, thereby greatly reducing its impact on the cation conductivity. What you see in this graph is a comparison of uh, cation exchangers, a traditional cation exchanger. And what you see here in the graph is a conductivity measurement of the high pressure steam of a combined cycle in blue and the condensate cation conductivity in red. And this is after a measurement with a traditional cation exchanger. Now what you see are the exact same samples where the cation conductivity is measured utilizing a, a vented cation exchanger. And you can see a tremendous difference, uh, particularly initially. In fact, it takes over two and a half hours for the uh, traditional unvented cation exchanger conductivity to trend down to the levels of the vented cation exchanger. So it greatly impacts your cation conductivity measurement as well as the degas cation conductivity measurement. Looking at the sample profile uh, as it transitions through a cation exchanger, your <coughs> incoming sample, of course you have your water, you have various contaminants, and your alkalizing or the chemistry that you're feeding uh, for pH control, in this case, ammonium hydroxide. It flows through the cation exchanger, and of course the incoming sample is typically pH value of greater than nine. It flows through the cation exchanger, then your sample pH is typically less than seven. Of course you have water, and then it moves the cations, therefore you're left with anions such as chloride, carbonate, formate and acetate. Now, if you're using degas cation conductivity, downstream of the degasser, what you have remaining is water, chlorides, formates, and acetates. It removes the carbonates and CO2. So before we move on to the next uh, portion of our presentation where we talk specifically about Swan's solution to measuring degas conductivity, we wanted to have a quick poll. Randy showed you some images earlier on about the kind of problems that can result from issues with steam purity. And um, we want to just get a feel for what we have in the audience today. What types of problems have you seen uh, in monitoring your steam pur purity? If you go ahead and click on whatever one of these is the level of problems that you've seen. So, Got about a third of our audience responding so far. I'm just going to keep this open for a little bit more. Okay, over half of you have responded. A couple more seconds here. And we're going to go ahead and close that up and uh, share the results with you. And uh, I had a little bit of a side bet with Randy. I said, Randy, anybody that's going to take a half hour out of their day just to hear us talk about degas cation conductivity, those are diligent enough people that they would have never let their system get to catastrophic failure. And that's what we've got here. But as you can see, um, everyone's had, except for a few folks, they've seen the problems that we talked about, the pitting, pitting that requires corrective action. And... Uh, we know that if you're monitoring it closely, hopefully you can get ahead of the game on this and, and not reach those last two categories. So, um, Randy, I'm going to hand it back to you, and if you could go ahead and uh, walk us through what the SWAN AMI degas cation conductivity can bring to the game. 
Thank you, Dominic. Okay, now what I want to take a, a few minutes and describe uh, our complete Swan AMI degas cation connectivity. It's a complete monitoring system for the automatic continuous measurement of three conductivity values as well as a, a few other things. It measures the specific conductivity. It measures your cation conductivity after the cation exchanger. And then it measures the degas conductivity after the reboiler for your degas cation conductivity. It also calculates your sample pH by differential conductivity and calculates the concentration of your alkalizing agent, in this case, ammonia. It is designed to remove 90 to 95 percent of the CO2 as compared to what you saw in the earlier slide of 28 to 58 percent on the uh, evaluation performed in 2004 by Dr. Drew. And the reason we can remove 90 to 95 percent is we employ something that is critical, which is precise boiling point temperature control, which we'll talk more about. What you see here is our degas conductivity monitoring system. Of course, you have the transmitter and the specific conductivity cell, which when the sample enters the monitoring system, the first thing that is performed is a measurement of the specific conductivity. Then the sample flows through the Vitton cation exchanger and past the cation conductivity sensor. And what you see on the right is the degasser control system. And here you see the heater, the heat exchanger, and the degas conductivity sensor. Now, looking more at the fluidics overview, the sample enters at O, flows past the specific conductivity sensor, then it enters the vented cation exchanger, flows down to the bottom, flows up through this pathway past the cation conductivity sensor. Once it exits the cation conductivity sensor, then it flows through an integrated flow sensor so that you know what your sample flow is, which is very important, which I'll talk about in a moment. Then it flows into the heat exchanger where the incoming sample cools the boiled sample. Plus, it's also preheating your incoming sample to make the reboiler more efficient. Goes through the heat exchanger into the reboiler where it is heated up to the to approximately uh, within a 0.5 degrees centigrade of the boiling point temperature. It exits the reboiler, goes to the heat exchanger, is cooled down to 40 to 50 degrees centigrade, flows through the degas conductivity sensor, and then to drain. Now, the importance of this flow sensor, it, it's to protect the instrument so that during startup, you typically have very intermittent sporadic sample flow. Typically what happens with reboiling systems is it loses sample flow during startup. The sample boils to dryness, then the sample flow is reestablished and that cold sample hits that heating element and damages it or destroys it. Since we measure the sample flow at a specified uh, flow value of less than three liter per hour, the reboiler is powered down to protect the reboiler. Once the sample flow uh, is greater than three liter per hour, it repowers the reboiler and begins measuring the degas conductivity again. The design of the system is ASTM 4519-94. As I said, since the incoming sample cools the boiled sample, there is no need for an independent cooling water source, which makes your uh, installation uh, 
less costly. It also provides a greater level of protection because you could lose your cooling water and then that sample is not cooled, which could damage your instrumentation. The electronic controller for the reboiler controls the operating temperature of the reboiler to maintain 90 to 95 percent removal of CO2. It, every six hours, it determines the boiling point temperature and controls within a half a degree centigrade of that boiling point temperature. It also has two barometric pressure sensors in the electronic controller so that if the barometric pressure changes sufficient to affect the boiling point temperature, it recognizes it and it activates the boiling point temperature determination process. Therefore, when measuring the gas conductivity, temperature is critical and you have to precisely control that temperature near the boiling point temperature for removal of 90% or greater carbon dioxide removal. Looking at some of the measurement design features, again, we mentioned earlier, it measures the specific, the cation and degas conductivity, which you see displayed on the screen right here. It will calculate the pH and the ammonia concentration, which is displayed on the second screen. It also displays the sample temperature and the flow at the bottom here. Again, it automatically powers down or shuts off the reboiler with loss of sample flow to protect the reboiler. And it's designed to consistently remove 90 to 95 percent of the carbon dioxide. It also has the capability of calculating uh, resin consumption with an alarm uh, to alert the user that the resin is nearing, nearing exhaustion. The value of the degas conductivity is it removes carbon dioxide so that the presence of more corrosive species such as chloride, sulfate, acetate, and formate can be monitored more effectively to eliminate the masking by the carbon dioxide. It can provide much faster startup times if you restrict steam to the steam turbine due to conductivity or other chemistry parameters. In that case, it increases your revenues, it reduces your startup costs, and it is also a valuable troubleshooting tool because you can use it to determine is the root cause of my elevated steam or condensate feed water cation conductivity, is it due to carbon dioxide or something more corrosive such as chlorides and sulfates? So it eliminates the guesswork. We're going to go over a few case studies here to show you the impact of measuring degas cation conductivity. And what you're going to see here is some commissioning data from a HERSIG. It's a tri pressure air cooled HERSIG. And the goal is for the cation conductivity of HP steam meeting the limit to admit steam to the steam turbine. It's being treated with ammonia and carbohydrate. So what you see is the red line is the cation conductivity and the blue line is the degas cation conductivity. And you can see there's a tremendous differential between the cation and the degas cation conductivity. And what you see at this line right here is they begin injecting carbohydrate, which once it reaches the temperatures sufficient to break down the carbon hydrazide to hydrazine and carbon dioxide, you see an increase in the cation conductivity as well as a slight increase in the degas cation conductivity. And this is due to CO2 